Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our lecture series, uh, Scholarly Writing for Publication. And uh, in a special way, I want to welcome you to Lecture 8. And uh, in Lecture 8, we are going to look at the phases of theory building, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now, maybe what I need to tell you at this material time is that the phases of theory building uh, include uh, conceptualize phase, uh, operationalize phase, uh, confirm phase, uh, apply phase, and refine phase. And I want to invite you to look at the screen. And on the screen here, you'll be able to see that diagram uh, that I call figure one. And that diagram, figure one, represents the phases of theory building. So in our lecture eight, we start examining the phases of theory building. Of course, beginning with the, what we call the conceptualized phase. But these are very important phases that we must all understand in order to do the theory building uh, job very well. So as I said, welcome uh, to our lecture eight. And in lecture eight, we shall be looking at phases of, uh, of theory building, but specifically looking at conceptualized phase. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, conceptual development is a, a common starting point for theory building in applied disciplines. If you look at the screen here, right, and you see uh, the conceptualized, in fact, you see in the arrows, right, uh, the arrows, uh, meaning that you start from the conceptualize level and then you go to operationalize and you go to the confirm, apply and refine. And then the process again returns. This is just a cyclical process as you can see there. And all those parts are very important because you are looking at the observed and experienced world as you can see in the diagram. And uh, the purpose of this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, is to describe the specific approaches to the conceptualized phase of theory building in applied disciplines, uh, as demonstrated by the figure that you have just seen, or the figure that you are still seeing on the screen here. Now, specifically, uh, this lecture will define and uh, describe the conceptualized phase, ladies and gentlemen. So we intend to define and we intend to describe the conceptualized phase, ladies and gentlemen. Again, we shall describe the general inputs uh, to this phase. Uh, we shall attempt to summarize the pro and cons of four approaches to the conceptualized phase. Uh, we shall go ahead and describe the outputs uh, of the conceptualized phase because we need to know what comes out of this uh, 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 stage, uh, right? And then we'll propose a set of quality indicators uh, for conceptualized uh, phase, ladies and gentlemen. Now, given the importance uh, of the conceptualized phase, and of course, uh, given the timeline that, and, and the, the time uh, that we need to go through this phase, I will, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, really break this um, uh, conceptualized phase into two lectures, as you will see. So I'll, now I, I, I think I start with part one, and then part two will come uh, later in our lecture uh, nine, ladies and gentlemen. So. So we want to, uh, that's where we shall end, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to understand this area very well. So we need to understand conceptual development. What is this conceptual development, the conceptualized phase? Conceptual development uh, is the specification of the key elements of the theory. Uh, so we need to really uh, specify the key elements. And, and this could actually be looked at as inputs into theory building. Right, specification of the key elements of the theory. And here we go into an initial explanation of their interdependence and the general limitations and conditions uh, which the theoretical frameworks can be expected to operate, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, the output of this phase is an explicit 
and thought out conceptual framework. And uh, that conceptual framework that comes out, that is uh, really well thought out, right, that is explicit, right, that you develop at the end of the day, right, will include a model, for instance. This conceptual framework will include metaphor developed from the theorist's knowledge uh, and experience with the rim or issue or the problem that the researcher is investigating. So again, as you look at this diagram, ladies and gentlemen, which is still on the, on the screen, uh, it hasn't been removed yet, you really discover that conceptual development constitutes the major idea that can become a theory, right? Uh, but is not by itself a theory. So much of the existing theory building discussion uh, and uh, uh, literature remains in this rim uh, only, ladies and gentlemen. So in, in fact, we can say at this material time that uh, much of what constitutes uh, popular management, uh, business and the other applied discipline books that uh, you buy and read almost remain in the state. They do not make measurable, useful, or applicable theory contributions. So they get stalled as an untested hypothesis. And this is why so many people disparagingly say, that is just a theory. So in the context like this, uh, scholars are actually proposing untested hypothesis. Uh, surprisingly, Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, I want to give you an example of a book that you have probably read over time, and you continue to read this book. And this is a book um, uh, that is titled, Who Moved My Cheese? Uh, and uh, it is uh, written by Spencer Johnson and Ken Blanchard, 1998, right? And we know for sure that this is one of the top selling business books, right, of all the time. Now again, uh, you will excuse me, but this elementary fable lets readers know that the idea and reality of change is upon us. And uh, the bottom line is for individuals, right, to suck it up, go for it, and that they may like it. Now, the problem in that book, right, the problem that we have here is that that book is no way, right, this book, ladies and gentlemen, in no way is it grounded in sound change theory, right? And the same book, ladies and gentlemen, does right, does not advance the theory of change. It doesn't. And added to this observation, right, and added to what the book presents, right, is the avalanche of corporate leaders requiring underlings, subordinates, to read the 96-page fable with the implicit message that these employees who had been working in bad systems were the ones to absorb the change. Now again, as you can see, nowhere in the scenario was there mention of leadership responsibility for irrational change that inflicted employee layoffs. Nowhere in the scenario, nowhere, when you read this book, nowhere in the scenario was there mention of questionable restructurings. Nowhere, ladies and gentlemen, in the scenario was a mention of frantic, what you may call the frenzied and frantic and mad mergers and general chaos that occurred. So what is the cheese? that is being described in this case or in this situation. So we need to understand these things very well because, right, most of the management books, right, and of course writings do not move to a next level of testing 
and most of the theories get stalled at this conceptualized level. So the ideas, right, in that book, Who Moved My Cheese, are brilliant ideas, good ideas. But possibly we need to have done more than what is there. So let's look at the inputs to conceptual development. So as you can see again, ladies and gentlemen, initiation of conceptual development in applied disciplines, right, comes from practical problems, right? Initiation of conceptual problems will come from incomplete existing theories. So if you have theories that are incomplete and cannot explain, provide the partial explanations, then we go into this stage of conceptual development of the theories. The third element are new areas of human activity. So the inputs to conceptual development are three. One, practical problems. Two, incomplete or existing theories. And three, new areas of human activities. And of course, as you can see, any of these three situations, ladies and gentlemen, signal a need for conceptual development work. For example, right, again, this is an example from Nansing. For example, nurse practitioners may experience problems in their work that push them to understand and explain what is happening. Right? Now, in the management literature, ladies and gentlemen, right, a manager might be confronted with deviations that do not fit existing explanations or theories. Right, and in this case, by the way, I could even give you more examples, right? In such situations, right, it means that you need to really get engaged into the development of theories that would be able to explain those particular situations. And if a particular theory is unable to explain what is happening out there, then you can, also look, you can look around for additional tools. If you can, for instance, add to theories, that is OK. But if that does not work, then you may be forced to start developing a new theory that explains that phenomenon. So as you can see, again today, since we are uh, talking about pandemics, right? we're talking about COVID-19, coronavirus disease pandemic, and uh, that has become uh, really a global public health emergency as of now, right? I mean, if you have new pandemics, if you have, if you have pandemics and new activities that have not been explained, right? This can also create a need for conceptual development, right? Uh, like now, during the COVID-19, we can start talking about virtual, right, team behavior. We can start talking about new normal for organizations, and uh, these have implications for EHRM. So you can start talking about, right, electronic human resource management, right? And if you have really those specific challenges of the time, then you start thinking about developing a theory that would better explain that, right? And of course, you are also aware that the COVID-19 pandemic crisis is creating new work-related challenges, but also presenting various opportunities. The COVID-19 pandemic has created challenges in areas like occupational health and safety. The COVID-19 pandemic has created challenges, right, in areas of work family issues, in areas of telecommuting, in the areas of virtual teamwork, in the areas of job insecurity, in areas of precarious work, issues of leadership, issues of human resources policy, 
issues on the aging workforce and careers, ladies and gentlemen. So researchers and practitioners need to factor the impact of pandemics in work and organizational processes uh, to shape the future of work and organizations in both the short and long term. So researchers and practitioners are invited to address the challenges and opportunities of COVID-19 head on by proactively innovating the work that uh, we do in support of workers, organizations, and society as well. So all these situations that I've just described, ladies and gentlemen, require gaining a new understanding, right? And therefore, we now start getting involved in what we call conceptual development or conceptualizing. And the careful observer, ladies and gentlemen, can see that inputs to conceptual development can come from, for instance, research, uh, can come from theory, can come from practice. In other words, any of the other phases presented in the general method of theory building and applied discipline can involve situations that push the theorists into the conceptual development phase. And again, for purposes of emphasis, uh, it's very important uh, for us to look at the theory building process, right? The diagram, figure one, right, is still on the screen here. As you can see, it's very important for us to emphasize the integrative and cyclical nature of theory building. And of course, in this case, we remind you that the theorist can begin anywhere in the model, but of course, move on up to other aspects of the model. So there are no defined starting and ending points, as you can see in the model, which increase the complexity uh, and ongoing nature of theory building, ladies and gentlemen. So, why can't I give you another illustration uh, for us to understand this conceptual stage of theory building? If you recall, I did tell you, and uh, scholarly writing for publication, I think it was our first lecture, or and second lecture, third and fourth, where I dealt with the different types of research and I talked about the, uh, the conceptual research, conceptual papers. And I said, at that level of developing conceptual papers, right, uh, you are more or less dealing with theory building, right? And that's what I told you. That is theory building. And now we are dealing with the conceptual, conceptualization. So if you are going to write a conceptual paper, you get engaged into theory building. Now, it doesn't matter whether what you want is a local theory, right, or you want a mid-range theory, or you want a grand theory, ladies and gentlemen. All the same what you are doing and what you are involved in at that material time is the theory building. So that's the conceptual level. So I want to give you another example of uh, a book that has been published and work has been done, right? And uh, this book was actually published in 2009, right? And it's a nice book, incidentally, if you need a copy, I can send you one, right? so that you read and understand uh, the ideas that, I, that I'm trying to present here. So as an illustration, I want you to look for this book and read it. Uh, and the book is a shop class as Sawcraft, an inquiry into the value of work by Matthew B. Crawled, uh, Crawford, Crawford uh, 2009. Uh, again, I think published, uh, initially published in 2009, and then, of course, there's another version of 2014, and is published by Penguin Group, ladies and gentlemen. So that's a very important uh, book that I'm going to uh, talk about in the next probably three, four minutes. Matthew Crawford is a philosopher and a motorcycle mechanic, and uh, this Matthew Crawford wrote a best-selling book on the inquiry into the value of work called Shop Class as a Soul Craft 2009. Now Crawford has a PhD in philosophy and he uses the verbal tools of philosophy to argue that he has had a greater sense of agency and competence doing manual work. 
don't forget, he's a motorcycle mechanic. And he says he has had that sense of agency, right? Don't forget, greater sense of agency, and the competency doing manual work compared to other jobs that were officially recognized as knowledge work. Now, Crawford continues to say that perhaps, most surprisingly, I often find manual work more engaging intellectually. And he says that in his book on page five. Now, Crawford relies on his book as a motorcycle mechanic to thread the reader through his view of the world. And as it stands, ladies and gentlemen, this book written by Crawford, as it stands, it can be classified as an engaging contribution for a philosophical theory of work. So if you really want to understand the philosophical theory of work, then you have to read the works of Matthew Crawford, right? And uh, I'm just telling you at this material time, it's a philosophical, right? He has an engaging contribution for philosophical theory of work, but not a contribution to an applied discipline of work theory. And I'm going to articulate that. Now Crawford's book is rich with intellectual argumentation and application examples. He has very brilliant arguments, right? And he has brilliant examples. And all these are spelled out in that book. So while this is a philosophical expose, ladies and gentlemen, the book has great potential to raise important applied questions about work theory. Right. And this purpose was not to build an applied theory of work, yet a careful reader could go through the pages and extract information to conceptualize, operationalize an applied theory of work based on that book. So it's a nice book, and I want to invite you to have a look at it and read so that you understand exactly what's happening. So why don't we look at processes for conceptual development? As I said earlier, the primary purpose of this lecture is to provide tools for scholars to engage in conceptual development, ladies and gentlemen. So if we can pick those tools, that will be very good. And four conceptual development methods are presented in this case. And these align with the four different philosophical orientations. I hope you've had an opportunity to attend my lectures on philosophy of science. So I will be able to introduce a few of those aspects. In fact, as you write your conceptual paper, we want to see the philosophy of science in that conceptual paper. We want to see the, your philosophical orientation, your perspective about reality out there. Right, and it is your perspective, your view, your world view, that will shape, right, the philosophy, the methodology, right, and the methods, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, axiology as well. So, the four conceptual development methods include, one, the quantitative approach in Dubin's 1978 theory building process, that is from uh, step one up to step four. Two, the grounded theory approach in Wetton's 2002 modeling as a theorizing process. And then three, ladies and gentlemen, the social construction approach in Wake's 1989 theory building as disciplined imagination, and four, a case study approach in Storbuck Walker's five components. So, ladies and gentlemen, those are the four aspects that we are going to discuss. 
Now these four methods that I've just given you provide complementary ways of completing the conceptual development phase. Conceptual development phase is very important, but it has to be completed. And some reflect very clear philosophical alignment, while others do not. So out of these four steps, some will reflect very clear philosophical alignment. And they can be integrated or used simultaneously to right, offer an explanation or conceptualization of a problem or an issue or knowledge that is scattered in the literature. So these can be integrated or used maintenously by the theorist, ladies and gentlemen. And the conceptual development phase is less restrictive than some other phases in terms of uh, philosophical orientations. And uh, theorists are free to use a variety of approaches and tools that are at their disposal, ladies and gentlemen. And you should use you should use what works and what is helpful. You are not really constrained by these things because you want to generate a set of linked concepts, right? Those concepts that the concepts that describe and of course explain some domain of human activity somewhere there. You want to generate right concepts and use concepts to abstract reality out there. And the abstraction process can be complex as we saw under modeling, actually models and modeling in our philosophy of science lectures. So at this material time, allow me to take you through these steps one by one. And I want to start with the quantitative approach that I gave you. And uh, these are the ones that are contained in uh, step one to step four of uh, Dubin's theory building method, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, Dubin's 1978 methodology involves eight steps, right? Now with the first four steps focused on conceptualization. So the first four steps really relate to uh, conceptualization, right? So conceptualization research is very important. Conceptualization in theory building, very important, and there's a first phase. And in research, if you fail to understand conceptualization, possibly you not go very far, right? Because that's the first step that you take. So as you can see, let me just give you the Dubbins 1978 all the eight steps and then concentrate on the four. For instance, the first step is um, developing the units of the theory. The second step, specifying the laws of uh, interaction, describing the relationships uh, among the units. Uh, three, defining the boundaries within which the theory is expected to function. Four, identifying the system states in which the theory is expected to function. Five, specifying the propositions or truth statements about how the theory is expected to operate. Six, identifying the empirical indicators uh, used to make the propositions testable. Seven, constructing hypotheses used to predict values and relationships among the units. And, ladies and gentlemen, the eighth step is conducting research to test the predicted values and relationships. So those are the eight uh, steps given by Dubin. Right. Now, the first four, as I said, uh, conceptual development steps are, uh, are the ones that actually uh, describe this aspect of conceptualization. Right. So let's look, go through the first step, units of a theory. Now, for Dubin, the units of the theory are the building blocks of the theory. So the units are the basic concepts that must come together to form a theory. Remember, you describe reality, but you use concepts to represent events. Do not forget that. And uh, those concepts are very important. So if you are defining the units right, of a theory, you are defining the concepts that you are using to represent events out there. So units are the basic concepts that must come together to form a theory. And in Dubin's approach, effort is spent defining units that work together in uh, functioning, right? In functioning 
the theory, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, the sub-processes uh, which are used to define and combine units. So these must be detailed. And uh, if they're not detailed, then the process becomes a little bit hard. Not very difficult, but hard. Step number two is laws of interaction. Right, again, this is a step in uh, uh, the eight steps articulated by Dubin. Now, the laws of interaction, ladies and gentlemen, describe the relationships among the different units. Remember, in step number one, you identify those units. You define those units. And those units that you have identified and defined are concepts. Now, when you go to step number two, laws of interaction, we want to understand how these concepts relate to one another to form that particular theory. So laws of interaction describe the relationships among the different units. And the units here refer to what we call concepts. And relatedness does not imply causality, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about relationships, do not again start talking about causality that, you know, He's saying A causes B. No, a relationship is just simply a relationship. For example, let me just give you an example, right? When flying in an aeroplane, you might experience turbulence, right? You are flying, right? You are on, you, you, you have a trip maybe uh, from Entebbe International Airport to Kenya. You are going to Nairobi. Right. Now, along the way, between Entebbe and the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, right, you experience turbulence. Now, often immediately before the plane shakes, right, the fastened safety belt sign comes on, right? So before the plane begins to shake a little bit, the way, I mean, actually, before you start feeling that turbulence on the plane, immediately the fasten safety belt sign will come on. You can actually see it flashing, right, the board there. Now, these two events can be described as related, right, because you know that very well. But the fastened safety belt sign turning on does not cause turbulence. But the two are related that actually before you experience that turbulence, before you feel it, that sign of fastening your seat belt comes on the board and you are able to see it flashing. So the two are related, but one does not cause the other. You cannot say because uh, fasten the seat belt sign, right, flashed on board, therefore it caused the turbulence out there. No. So at this stage, relationships are the focus, right? At this stage, you are, we are focusing on relationships and not causality. If causality is suspected, ladies and gentlemen, it should be made clear here, but tested later. We are interested at this in material time relationships. So we move to step number three, the boundaries of a theory. Remember, I've already talked about this, especially when we are talking about the types of theories, right? We looked at the mid-range theories, we looked at the local theories and grand theories. So the distinction between these three theories centered around one of the aspects that I'm talking about at this material time, which is the boundary of a theory. The boundaries of a grand theory, right, are probably broader compared to the ones of a local theory, right, and uh, mid-range theories. So for a grand theory, you can generalize your findings because the boundaries are broad, right, as you can see. So in this case, the boundaries of the theory, ladies and gentlemen, describe the limits of the theory, and they set the context in which the theory is meant to operate. 
And this is very important uh, for us because boundaries are important so as not to over interpret the intentions and reality of the theory under development. So the boundaries are very important and they are part of the conceptualization phase of a theory. Step number four is what we call the system states. So we go to the system states and system states are important, right? Because you have now the units, right? And these units, right, are operate within certain boundaries. So you create a system at the end of the day. So when we reach the system states, so the system states actually describe distinct characteristics of the theory while it is in operation. So while the theory is in operation, we must describe the distinct characteristics right, of that theory. And uh, we must do this very well. That's why, in other words, we are saying, system states are descriptions of separate discrete phases or transitions the theory must evolve through in order to operate. Let me just give you an example. For example, human beings have two discrete system states, right? Awake and asleep. So if you are talking about a theory that describes a human being, right, then you must be able to give us the system states, whether you are talking about uh, a human being or an individual who is awake or an individual who is asleep. And that is given in Dubin 1978, ladies and gentlemen. So this approach, as you can see, is a very detailed and uh, process-driven approach to conceptual development. Again, Darby 1978 called the results of conceptual development a theoretical model. Ladies and gentlemen, at this material time, allow me to take you through quantitative approach and uh, looking at the Quetens modeling as a theorizing. Remember, we've looked at um, the works of Dabin, but we need also to bring in the works of Quetten 2002. So, and here we deal with the quantitative approach and Quetten uh, uh, looks at modeling as a theorizing. So uh, even at this level, uh, when we try to do this modeling, we are theorizing, ladies and gentlemen. So what in 2002 presents a clear method for conceptual development. And according to Whitten, uh, there are about four major steps, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that are very important. And these steps include, uh, one, you identify constructs. And of course, in the process of identifying constructs, as articulated by Whitten, you answer the question, what? Then you go to the next uh, step, understand the relationships between the constructs. And here you answer the question, how? Then you go to number three, identify the assumptions undergirding the relationships. You answer the question, why, ladies and gentlemen? And then you go to step number four, identify the context of the theory you answer the question, when, where, and who, ladies and gentlemen. So what we are going to do at this material time is to describe uh, these, uh, sorry, each of the uh, steps here briefly. So why don't we start with step number one, uh, that is written, uh, written 2002 uh, steps, and these are quantitative steps. What as a construct, right? Now, Wetten recommends using sticky notes uh, to represent the major pieces of the theory. So if you're talking about a theory, you are building a theory, right? Theory building, of course, which is a conceptual stage. Uh, Wetten uh, uh, recommends that you should use sticky notes. And these sticky notes can then be uh, rearranged as the uh, introduction of new constructs or as the logic of theories 
uh, 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 the, the logic of the theorists really evolve over time. So the sticky notes, of course, you'll have those sticky notes. And you'll be now identifying these particular concepts, right, uh, which again were referred to uh, as, right, you recall, uh, units by Dubin, 1978, right, and that's what we have. So, anyway, these are very important. So we go to step number two, how, and that's the question of how, right, so how now is the relationship? How as a relationship? What an emphasized the relationship between the constructs being key, being key to moving from ideas to theory. So if you want to move from ideas, remember you have concepts, you have units, right? And these concepts represent events, right? Now, of course, you must demonstrate that these are related at that material time. But we see here, Dubin telling us, that we need to understand the relationship between constructs because they help us move from ideas to a theory, and that's the theory development process. So as you can see first, uh, we need to be aware that there is no consensus regarding the language of how, and the sh theories should use a variety of techniques uh, to describe relationships, ladies and gentlemen. Now, second, you need to keep in mind that many of the more detailed and technical discussions of relationship types uh, or forms have a very strong methodological orientation. And of course, third, ladies and gentlemen, all organizational scholars need to come to terms with the natural sum issue of causality in social science research. Right, so just you, you, we just have to understand where you, as a theorist, where you begin and where you end, right? So again, the issue of relationship, the issue of causality is important, but for the first thing that we need to look at is actually the relationship. And if you want to really discuss causality, uh, that can be done later on. So just where, uh, 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 does that this kind of relationship and causality begins and ends is a matter uh, or an issue which is um, uh, at the back of the mind of the theorist, somebody who's trying to develop this theory. So step number three is the why. And why as conceptual assumptions, right? So when you talk about why, you start now thinking about assumptions, right? What are the conceptual, conceptual assumptions? And conceptual assumptions are the fundamental organizing principles that support the theory, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why Wetten says, that's what Wetten says. Now these assumptions frame the logical reasoning behind the choice of constructs and definition of their relationships. Uh, let me again give you an example so that you understand what we are talking about. I'll take you back to the theory that I gave you, the human capital theory developed by Becker, right? Becker's human capital theory involves the concept of education and income, among others. Now, according to Wetten, the conceptual assumptions would be required to provide a logical reasoning for including these concepts and to define how they are related to each other. So do not simply bring things in there, right? We, we're supposed to have that logical uh, thinking and logical reasoning and logical relationships. The, so the last step, uh, again from Wetton, is the when, where, who, as contextual assumptions. These are now context specific. Remember when we were defining the local theories, the mid-range, and grand theories, we did talk about the contexts, right, context. For local, the contexts are usually very, very local, and this could be organizational specific, right, and you can't transfer the experience from one organization to another organization, ladies and gentlemen. So contextual assumptions identify the boundaries of the theory, right. And boundaries simply locate the theory in the larger domain 
by defining the specific area of human system activity, ladies and gentlemen. And contextual assumptions can include categories based on industry, based on culture, and the other factors that um, uh, establish the limits of the theory. So those are the quantitative aspects taken from Wetton 2002. I want now to go to another aspect, qualitative approach, and the qualitative approach taken from uh, works theorizing as disciplined imagination. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Weck outlined an approach he believed to be more supportive of theorizing as a, a process involving imagination, a process involving representation, a process involving choice. Now, this concern or the concern at this material level is with how to get the theory building effort started. Because the conceptualization stage allows the theorists room to let the imagination influence the theory building process. And as a result, his approach is not linear, as I've already uh, mentioned, especially with our diagram that I showed you, which was figure one. And actually, we can actually put that figure back so that you understand what we are talking about. We said you start with the conceptualize, you go to operationalize, as you can see on the diagram here, confirm, apply, and then refine. And this is a cyclical process, ladies and gentlemen. So this allows theorists room to let the imagination influence the theory building process. And as a result, his approach is not linear. So instead, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 wake, as you can see here, right? And uh, so many other scholars here have provided three tools for the theories to work with in crafting theories. So we can actually use these three tools. We can work with these three tools uh, in crafting theories. The first one is what we call problem statements. Right. The second one, ladies and gentlemen, are what we call thought trials. And the third one is the selection criteria. So these are very important, right? The problem statement, the thought trials, and the selection criteria. Those are the three aspects that you must work with. So let's start with the problem statements uh, so that we understand what we are talking about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's a fundamental difficulty in formulating problem statements for theory development research. And uh, this is because by their very nature, the problems imposed on organizational theories involve so many assumptions, such a mixture of accuracy and inaccuracy that virtually all conjectures and all selection criteria remain plausible and nothing gets rejected or highlighted. Now, to solve this problem, right, uh, uh, if you want to solve this problem, start working on mid-range theories or theories that are solutions to problems that contain a limited number of assumptions and considerable accuracy and detail in problem specification, ladies and gentlemen. In other words, grand theories are overly complex in their possible assumptions and selection criteria. And mid-range theories require clear problem statements because they have clear boundaries. And these solutions are less generalizable because they define a more precise domain of actions in the world. Now, without clear and precise problem statements, ladies and gentlemen, attempts at theory building are misguided and vague. And of course, from here you can see two key conclusions can be distilled for theory builders using WECS approach. Right, of course, these are one, Problem statements must be detailed. Problem statements must be clear. Problem statements must be precise. 
Two, the nature of the problem can be highly practical or theoretical. And uh, both are valuable, though the climate of applied discipline favors application and utility, ladies and gentlemen. So let's move to the second level. That was problem statements. We must develop problem statements. Then two, thought trials, right? And of course, thought trials are different ways to address problem statements. And as you can see for work, the key to good theory building is to help the theorist generate diverse sets of possible solutions. And of course, a lack of diverse thinking is thought to be directly related to the strong influence of preference and experience. And to produce a better theory, the use of classification systems is recognized. So ladies and gentlemen, in organizational literature, these classification systems might include thought trials from varying philosophical perspectives, right? And here you'll be looking at things like, does a thought trial look different, right, to a positivist as compared to a social constructionist? And that's why I talk about really thought trials being looked at from varying philosophical orientation. Because a thought trial for a positivistic may not be similar to a thought trial to the anti-positivistic. Right, a thought trial to a phenomenologist, right, could be totally different from a thought trial to a hermeneutic, ladies and gentlemen. So we need to look at these things from different philosophical perspectives. But we can also look at thought trials from varying demographic perspectives. And here we look at thought trials in terms of, for instance, uh, the, 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 the type of the organization, the nature of the individuals or employees. So issues of gender, issues of organizational age and size, it is whether somebody is um, really planning to retire or not, all these are key things which are very important. Now, here, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say that the key point for theory builders following Wake's approach is to stretch their thinking as widely as possible and entertain a diverse set of assumptions and possible solutions. And uh, of course, that becomes very important, right, in determining this conceptual stage or conceptualization. Let me take you to the fourth aspect, right, and that is selection criteria. So theorists generally evaluate their thinking by posing questions to themselves, right, and that is now the selection bit because you must take a decision. The criteria that lies behind these questions incorporates considerable past experience with related problems. The conjecture is being tested against the theorists prior experiences that has been edited down into assumptions. And of course, at this material time, biases and assumptions are clear issues in selection criteria, and they can create a bridge from the theories to a more useful theory if they are carefully and explicitly examined, ladies and gentlemen. So self-conscious manipulation of the selection process is the hallmark of theory construction. And uh, here, the greater the number of diverse criteria applied to a conjecture, the higher the probability that those conjectures which are selected will result in a good theory. And if criteria, right, are altered each time a conjecture is tested, few conjectures will be rejected and little understanding will accumulate. This amounts to making the problem fit uh, uh, the solution, ladies and gentlemen. So, highlighting 
The problem of theorist bias based on past experience is a worthy caution. Theorists should reflect on the ideas as they evolve. And there are specific solutions, right, uh, which will result. And these specific solutions will vary in the appeal to a variety of theorists. Therefore, it is useful to be as forthcoming about biases as possible. In fact, researchers aim at reducing this bias, ladies and gentlemen. So, conceptualization work is part at, right? And the theorists will do well to document their thinking and development processes as carefully as possible. Right, so let me now give you the qualitative bit. Right, again, the qualitative approach from Stoberg's Walker's Five Component approach. Maybe I should also prepare you, ladies and gentlemen, that very soon, within the next few minutes, right, I will be ending my lecture. Right, and then we shall probably return later on. As I told you, this conceptualized phase of theory building will be divided into lectures, part one and part two. Right, so we are now dealing with the first part. So, as you can see, this is now the qualitative approach, Stoberg Walker's five component approach. So, Stoberg uh, Walker 2007 articulates an approach uh, to conceptual development that consists of five components. And the five components form more of a process for preparing to develop a theory than for specifically generating the foundational theory concepts. And these five components, ladies and gentlemen, are one, examine the alternative perspectives and processes. Two, resolve paradigm issues. Three, resolve foundational issues. Four, resolve preliminary research design issues. And five, ladies and gentlemen, identify and select the appropriate modeling process. So those are the five qualitative aspects. Allow me to take you through one by one, but again, briefly. One, point number one was examine alternative perspectives and processes. Now this component, ladies and gentlemen, is aimed at clarifying a variety of possible choices on precisely how to approach a theory development effort. And then, of course, here you ask yourself questions. Should I follow Dubin or Witten? So, at this moment of time, you have a major decision to make as a theorist. You start asking yourself, how could case study and grounded theory approaches be useful? What do I know about the domain of human activity? And what does that suggest? So at this material time, ladies and gentlemen, a theorist should examine a variety of approaches to the topic of interest to make a series of choices depending on such right factors as purpose, such factors as experience, such factors as methodological exposure, right, and access, ladies and gentlemen. So methodological exposure is very important. Let's go to the second step. Resolve paradigm issues. This is very important. There's no way you're going to do research without a paradigm. So, it is important to acknowledge the difference, our differences in assumptions that underlie varying approaches to theory development. Many theory scholars encourage multi-paradigm theory building research or multiple thought trials from different perspectives, ladies and gentlemen. However, experts in theory building do not often provide explicit details about the cognitive decision-making process of theory building 
or the influence of assumptions and prior experience on those decisions. So theory builders are advised to reflect on how different paradigms will impact the theory development and uh, realize that choices here will have a strong influence on the output of the theory development effort as a whole. That takes us to the third stage, resolve foundational theory issues. There are those foundational issues. So theorists are likely to have affinity to certain foundations over others. Some theories, for instance, or some, not theories, some theorists, right, may view critical theory as a relevant foundation, while others may view human capital theory as more relevant, ladies and gentlemen. So, strategies for working with alternative theories are recommended. So, what are those strategies? One, accept the paradox and use it constructively. Two, clarify misaligned propositions and define their connections among them. Three, require a time element. Four, create an entirely new approach. So these could be some of the strategies for working with alternative theories, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go to the fourth component of resolving the issue, resolving preliminary research design issues, ladies and gentlemen. So theorists must think ahead you must think ahead to the eventual research design, even in the preliminary stages of identifying constructs. In the long run, ladies and gentlemen, the best theory is only as good as its evidence. If you are talking about a theory, right, a good theory, as described by Paul et al. 2000, a good theory, Right, what you call the best theory, in the long run, ladies and gentlemen, the best theory is only as good as its evidence. So theory builders should consider the best fits in terms of research design strategies that will eventually be required. So let's go to the fifth component, right? I said I will describe these ones briefly, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see the fifth component, the goal of conceptual development. And don't forget the fifth component is select the appropriate modeling process. Modeling is very important. So the goal of conceptual development is to put forth a representation of the theory under construction. And Wetton's 2002 modeling as theorizing approach provides a clear process for achieving such a virtual representation. And uh, of course, in this case, the graphical mapping process can be started at any time during the conceptual development phase. And of course, it doesn't have to come at the end, but of course, the graphical mapping process, the mind mapping process, ETC, uh, begins earlier on after you have described your, uh, your, your, your boundaries and the units right, of the theory, then you start the mind mapping process. And of course, we also have software-driven modeling and other processes. They do exist to help the theories create a model, and uh, each has advantages and disadvantages that are beyond the purpose of this lecture, ladies and gentlemen. But the ultimate goal is to choose the modeling approach that is most beneficial to representing the proposed model. Ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, I did say that Strobach Walker 2007 articulates an approach to conceptual development that consists of five components. And if you recall, those five components were one, examine alternative perspectives and processes, two, resolve paradigm issues, right? Paradigmatic issues, you resolve foundational theory issues resolve preliminary research design issues, and five, identify and select appropriate modeling. I've already covered the, last, uh, the first four uh, components, 
And now the last component, which is the fifth, is what I'm going to describe. And that, this will take us to the end. But as we go to the end, uh, I want to put up a figure here, uh, which is actually figure two, that you see on the screen here, uh, which actually describes the four processes of conceptual development. And that's where we shall end, and then I'll begin from there next time. So if we go to the fifth component that I've been talking about here, select the appropriate modeling processes. So the goal of conceptual development is to put forth a representation of a theory under construction, ladies and gentlemen. And according to Wetton's 2002 modeling, a theorizing approach provides a clear process for achieving such a visual representation. And in this visual uh, representation, right, the graphical market mapping process, right, or uh, what you call mind mapping and so forth, the graphical mapping process can be started at any time during the conceptual development phase, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, this does not have to come at the end of the process, so, but any time you can start the process. So mind mapping, software-driven modeling, and other processes exist to help the theorist create a model and each has advantages and disadvantages that are beyond our lecture, ladies and gentlemen. But the ultimate goal is to choose the modeling approach that is most beneficial to representing the proposed model. And the four conceptual development methods uh, which I have discussed, ladies and gentlemen, have complementary elements and conflicting elements, ladies and gentlemen. So if you look at this figure two, Right, that has been on the uh, uh, on the screen here for some time now. You will see that um, we have four processes of conceptual development, ladies and gentlemen. Now, these four processes of conceptual development, ladies and gentlemen, right, again draw from the inspirations of Wake. Wetten, Strawberg, Walker, and Dabin. And here we have what we call features, right? If you look at the first row with features, you see according to Dabin, talks about units, laws of uh, interaction, boundary system states. If you go to wake, problem statements, right? Thought trials, selection criteria, right? If you go to Wetten, the what, how, why, uh, where, who, Right, and we just actually created these things a few minutes ago. And Strawberg Walker examine alternative perspectives and processes, right? Resolve foundational issues and so forth. Resolve research design issues, that kind of thing. Right, again, when we go to Pro, that's the second row, right? Under Dubin talks about you have detailed, clear, process-driven, step by step. You go to Wake, right? Flexible, uh, intuitive-driven. If you go to Waiting accessible, process-driven, and if you go to Strawberg, general and categorical. Now again, when you look at the cons, according to Dubin, inflexible, right, extreme, and if you go to uh, Strawberg, you have paradigm-based, right? So these are the perspectives from these scholars, and then the philosophical orientation perspective in the, uh, in the last row, ladies and gentlemen. Under Dubin, you talk about the quantitative, Right, and the work you talk about the social construction, uh, waiting, grounded theory, and Strawberg Walker, uh, case study, or multi paradigm, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much uh, for attending this lecture. And uh, I must say that uh, this lecture has um, uh, focused on the phases of theory building, but more so looking at the conceptualization stage. Uh, uh, of phase, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, I just want to invite you to uh, again uh, a, another lecture that will follow this, uh, uh, which is lecture nine, that will help us uh, complete the conceptualization process. And lecture nine uh, will specifically look at theorizing tools so we intend to use theorizing we intend to examine theorizing tools so thank you very much for attending this lecture i can say stay well stay safe have a nice time bye